As we think and speak about the holy, we come to words that are very familiar, words that can oftentimes have meaning that are very religious, sometimes social or cultural. We think about things that may be formal, ritual, liturgical. Uh, we think about words that can oftentimes speak of deep existential experience, the way in which something seems sacred, elevated, uh, out of the ordinary. The word holy simply means set apart, distinct, but it can play out in all sorts of different spheres. And so as we come to think about what it means to be holy or to be made holy by God, we have to do a lot of excavatory work to think about what's distinctly Christian. In what ways are we using the language of holiness as a reality, as a state, as a gift, in ways that overlap with and break with their use in wider culture? Oftentimes we sometimes sort of assume that holiness involves the social mores of a, a given people group. Uh, we don't do this, we do do that. We wouldn't dare go there or interact with them, but we would be here and we would engage in these things. In different societies and in different denominations, these may be identified in different ways, but the word holy gets used often in all those contexts. In recent decades, one of the most helpful thinkers in addressing holiness as a Christian has been the ethicist Stanley Harawas. Perhaps it's useful to begin by examining ways in which Harawas has talked about holiness and sanctification as something of a, a basis point and a foil for our own approach. Harawas has analyzed ways in which holiness can oftentimes describe the mores of not Christian society, but American or modern Western society. Ways in which certain practices and rituals of all sorts from participating in consumer culture and taking in uh, marketing ads to participating in patriotic rituals, uh, saluting the flag or, or saying the Pledge of Allegiance, the ways in which these form uh, certain values, certain commitments, certain assumptions. Harawas has suggested that Christians need to think carefully about the way in which Jesus makes disciples setting them apart by enlisting them in what could be called counter practices of the kingdom of God. Ways in which they're discipled by following the path of Jesus, by participating in new rituals like baptism, the Lord's Supper, other practices that may be less familiar but are no less uh, definitive of the Christian way, washing of feet, forgiving enemies, caring for the poor. As Harawas describes uh, the practice of holiness and the experience of sanctification, he and many of his students have focused on what we could call ecclesial practices, ways in which growing up or growing into the Christian faith molds one to live in a distinctively Christian way. By passing the peace, for instance, in the middle of a church service, we learn to view others in a certain way, in a uniquely Christian way, as those who may have a, a different race, gender, socio, uh, political class affiliation, and yet who are our brother or sister in Christ, who are to be treated and welcomed in a certain way, to be valued and embraced in a certain manner. And so we could say that in that and many other examples, Harawas is describing an ecclesiocentric approach to holiness. There's much to commend it, both in the way in which he has diagnosed our broader culture, the way in which a variety of practices have formative effect, and then also how there's that prescriptive return to the routines or rhythms of the Christian faith, the way in which God longs to mold us, and the way in which the church really is, as Robert Louis Wilkin has put it, its own distinct culture that interacts with uh, and mixes with the various cultures of the world. And yet this ecclesiastical ethics is not an evangelical ethics of the sort that's going to be pursued here. That focus on practices and ecclesiastical formation is no doubt necessary. In fact, it's crucial to making sense of the way in which God called out Israel as a people meant for himself. But that approach is not thereby theologically sufficient as a Christian description of thinking the holy and of the good. So we want to make sense of a still further angle on holiness and sanctification. We want to tend to the witness of folks like John Owen, the 17th century theologian, who would speak of what he called evangelical holiness regularly. 
Owen there wasn't undercutting the idea that liturgy and worship and the practices of the church had formative impact, but he was highlighting the fact that holiness itself is an evangelical reality. That is, it's a gift of the gospel of God. He looked to verses like this word from the Apostle Paul, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. That benediction at the end of 1 Thessalonians in chapter 5 highlights the fact that God himself surely sanctifies. He sanctifies us all the way through. It highlights a number of facets of what it means to be human, suggesting that God will uh, address the totality of human life and that God will set us apart in every sphere, not merely our mind or our heart or our hands, but the whole person. Just as Deuteronomy 6 had called us to love the Lord with all that we have, heart, soul, and mind, so here God himself will surely set us apart. He will transform and change us. And so as we think about sanctification and the gift of holiness, we want to make sure we appreciate it as a gift prior to a duty, that we appreciate it as something that God brings about prior to thinking about disciplines and rhythms and practices that we are somehow to inhabit and to exercise. We want to exercise what Oliver O'Donovan's referred to as Christian wakefulness, the practice of being alertly attentive and thinking about how Jesus himself is involved in our very midst, that the risen Christ is not aloof or absent. He's not off on vacation having run a great race, but he, from the right hand of the Father on high, continues to work as our great high priest. He not only has brought about our justification, but he now continues to watch over us, to shepherd or pastor us, as Hebrews 13 puts it, so that he is just as involved in our sanctification now as he was in our justification or conversion. That's why the 16th century reformer John Calvin would say that the whole substance of our salvation is to be found in Christ. It's not merely that the totality of our forgiveness, that the totality of our reconciliation is somehow in Christ and his substitutionary work, but that also the ongoing daily plod, the long trajectory and journey of growing in Christian distinctiveness and growing conformity to the image of God in Christ, that too is to be found in Christ alone, that he is as active and involved today as he was in the first century and as he shall be on Judgment Day. So as we think about uh, the gift of sanctification, the way in which God makes holiness a reality in our midst and in our very selves, we want to think about it as a, a gift of the gospel. And we want to think about the gospel as a reality, not just in the precious past tense of the once for all work of Christ, nor simply in the future return of Christ in glory to stand in our stead on judgment day, but also we want to think of that gospel in the present tense, the way in which Jesus is now active and engaged to change us, to transform us, to conform us to his very image.